Okay, let's bring our, oh good, good. Let's bring our first speaker up uh, and welcome her, Mary Ann Freeman. Now, Mary Ann was uh, one of the first Class 8s on the Apollo ship uh, under LRH, was personally trained by LRH, uh, Senior Ethics Specialist, Auditor, CS. She represents the group up in um, Idaho? Yeah, in Coeur d'Alene. Okay. At the Life Enhancement Center. Uh, let's give her a hand. Well, hi. hi. Welcome to our 10th anniversary. Thanks to... Ray, who put this here. So I just want to acknowledge Ray for doing this. Thank you. Okay, now the first misunderstood that we may, may have to handle is my name. He called me Mary Ann. Interesting enough, that was my born name, Mary with a capital A N N E. But ever since the sixth grade, I've been called Mary. So I don't know how he found out about that. Somebody snitched. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> I'm so glad all of you are here. How many of you were at the last year's convention in Idaho? Oh, about five or six people. Good, I get to tell my stories all over again, and you guys can be reminded. <laughs> okay, well, I won't tell all my stories because I have to talk about the spooky stuff today. All right, so um, anyway, I got into Scientology in 1962. I met Ron for the first time. That was pretty spooky. <laughs> he was very charismatic, you know, very powerful, very uh, lots of energy around him. And uh, he got up on the stage in a gold lame jacket to a drum roll. This was at a convention. And uh, it was uh, a clearing congress, actually in Washington, D.C. I think it was at the Marriott, if I remember, or the, I started with an M, I think. Maybe it was, I, it was in Washington in 1962, Labor Day weekend, and it was the Clearing Congress, which he had many. Yes, John? Oh, yes, I have to slow down. When I'm excited and nervous, I speak 80 miles an hour. I have to slow it down to at least 75. Okay. <laughs> Probably where he taught the problems intensive. That was what he taught. The prep check buttons, the buttons that can su about suppressing and invalidating all those buttons. He taught that. And he had people walking around the stage demonstrating live items in the bank. And in those days, there was very little confidentiality. So all the spooky stuff was freely discussed about your own case, about other people's case, everybody was wide open about it. Slow down, okay, thank you. Yes, and <laughs> so we had these whole track items, you know, beingnesses, identities, walking around the stage in opposition to each other, just like in the bank. And he was showing us, this is what we all have to deal with. This is why we're here. This is what it's all about, Scientology, to clear these things out. So uh, that was my first introduction, really, to the subject uh, from L. Ron Hubbard, plus the fact that he had a sore thumb. He held it up and he showed everybody, and I never forgot that. So I was one of the lucky ones who knew he wasn't perfect. <laughs> So um, that was a wonderful time. I met him and shook his hand. And the gal in front of me, her name was Valerie Stansfield. Many of you may know her. She was online to meet Ron at the uh, reception after the Congress. And she said to him, Ron, I will audit. And he shook her hand and he said, thank you. And he had flaming red hair at the time. And then I was right behind her. I had to walk up to him and say that I was going to be an auditor also, but how could I follow this little fireball in front of me? <laughs> so I tried to be real casual. I said, hi, Ron, it's really nice to meet you, and I'm going to be auditing someday. I'm going to get some training and just want to say hello. He said, thank you. <laughs> Tone 40 into my head. 
And I sort of went exterior, you know. So that was my first experience talking to Ron. And then um, I just kind of continued along in the New York org, and then I came down to Washington, D.C., because there was no academy in New York in those days. And I had to become an auditor, professional, so I had to go to the D.C. org. And I was staying at a rooming house down the block from the org. And it was an old building from Civil War days. And I had a room downstairs, and, or on the second floor. There was a second floor and a first floor, I think. And in the middle of the night, for no reason why I was sleeping, my bed crashed. And I was like this. It, it broke for no reason. There was nobody with me or anything. I was just in bed sleeping and crashed. So I woke up and, oh my god, my bed's broken. I better get out of here. I'll look and see if there's an empty room on this floor. So I looked and I found a big empty room right next door. I walked in and there were two beds, big nice beds, all made. The room was all neat. Nobody in there, I thought. And I got in bed. And all of a sudden, this voice in my head, and I was not into voices in my head in those days, uh, <laughs> says, get out, like that. And this had never happened to me before in my life. I jumped up, I went, who's that, who said that? And this voice says, get out. And I realized, this must be a ghost, because there's nobody in the room, but I'm hearing this loud and with tremendous intention and force. So I jumped out of bed, and I started leaving the room. He says, wait, before you leave, you must make the bed and put it back exactly the way it was before you got into it. So I, I was so terrified, I just ran back. And, you know, I was fairly new to the subject. I'd been in under a year. You know, I took comm courses and co-audits and stuff, but I wasn't used to this kind of stuff. <laughs> anyway, I got out of bed, and I quickly made the bed. I fixed it and ran out back to my room and, got, and pulled the mattress out on the floor so it would be flat, and I um, sort of got to sleep. So I didn't know what to do about that. It was just a scary uh, event in the middle of the night, and I didn't know who to talk to about it. I just went on course, and I was in the academy, and about, I don't know, maybe a month later, two gals, came on course as new students because we had this ongoing academy. People would come in new and people would graduate and it was a fabulous course, the best course I ever took in Scientology except for the Class 8 course. But anyway, so there I was and in my bed sleeping normal in my little house there and in the next room these two new students moved in to that room that I had used for refuge the first night and was kicked out of. And another day or two goes by and I'm thinking, what are they going to encounter? This should be interesting. And I thought, well, maybe it was just that one time a freaky thing happened and I didn't hear anything. And then finally, one night, they knocked on my door and they said, Mary, we want to talk to you. <laughs> I said, yeah? They said, we think there's a ghost in our room. I said, oh, oh how interesting. I think you're right. And they said, they ke it keeps bothering the cat. So they had this kitty cat in there, and every time the cat walked past a certain part of the room, its hair would stand on end. <laughs> so they said, we should do something. It feels very strange in here. There's like really dark stuff going on. And a friend of theirs had a Ouija board. Well, I had never seen a Ouija board before. <laughs> so they were, and these are, this is back in the days when Scientology was very different than it is today. I tell you, the, the closest thing to the way it was back then is the Free Zone. The Free Zone is my Church of Scientology. It's still alive. It is, I recognize it. I recognize you can go to an auditor over here, an auditor over there. Some, some are squirrels. Some are very excellent auditors that have good reputations. Some were trained by Ron, some not. Uh, you could get a course in one or you could take a class in another or, or a, a center. There weren't missions, there were franchises. So it was very loose and open, just the way the free zone is now. So I feel like I'm home, you know, in the free zone. Yeah. 
So to get on with my spooky story, so there we are on this Ouija board. I wasn't on there. The two other gals were, the new students. Slow down. And they were doing the Ouija thing, and they get the first thing that they get on that board was G E T O U T. So I thought, that's familiar. <laughs> we got the same guy, okay? And they said, Who are you? And he writes, Ben, B E N. That was his name. And they said, What are you doing here? And he just says, Get out. And they said, well, You're not very friendly, are you? He says, No. <laughs> they said, Well, quit bothering the cat. And he said, No. And they, they, we said, Can we ask you some questions? He goes, No. And we said, they said, well, you're a real ornery type, aren't you? Unfriendly. And he says, yes. So uh, they said, well, put somebody else on that we can talk to. You know, get off the board. I mean, these are, you know, <laughs> Scientologists. Only, only in Scientology. So this guy sort of wandered off and the next thing we get the circle again now, i didn't know how this thing worked but i watched it and this was the process and i was just sitting there observing and suddenly i get all this information coming into my head all this stuff i start understanding things that were being sort of referred to and this new person got on and they asked her name and she said ellie she spelled it e-l-l-i-e and I said, who are you? And I got the answer off. I wasn't on the board. And I said, this is his wife. And she goes, yes. And I said, she's still. And they said, what are you doing here? We live here. This is our house. They owned that whole house in those days, in the Civil War days. And I said, she's still tied by her marriage vows. And she goes, yes. She felt like finally somebody understood because she didn't have anybody to talk to, or nobody heard her. She was sort of cut off. So, um, um, obviously, because she didn't have, you know, the communication systems that we have with bodies. But anyway, she had tele telepathic really good. And this was the first time that I had been introduced to that level of communication, directly, like that. I didn't know what to make of it, but it was very interesting. And they said, why? And she said, uh, I said, why does Ben want us out of here? And she wrote, she wrote on the thing, spelled out, hate hurts, is what she said. Hate hurts. And then she told her story, and I got a lot of the pictures. He's still sitting. He used to sit by the window. Yes, he still sits by the window. He was stuck, being wounded in the Civil War, and he died. And he never thought he, never thought he died. He still sat at the window. And, oh, while he was still on the board, I forgot this one part, the girls said to him, why don't you get a new body at the hospital? And he says, a baby? He spelled it out, a baby? And they said, yeah, yeah, a baby body. He goes, no. <laughs> so anyway, we asked Ellie. We said, why won't he, won't, she, he won't admit that he's dead, or whatever you want to call it, transformed out of a physical form. So as a result, they finally kind of calmed down and the two girls were able to stay in the room and the cat wasn't bothered anymore. I guess maybe Ellie had a good long talk with him. Whatever happened after that, it was definitely a good thing because communication had occurred and ARC went in more than it was before. And I suddenly had a seventh dynamic. So that was my introduction <laughs> to the spirit world. On course, yeah. That was really amazing. Now, um, before being in the Church of Scientology at it, as it now is, uh, those kind of things could be discussed and talked about these days, I'm sure. How many of you have been recently out of the church? Like within the last year, say? Two years, three years? Four years? Five years. All right. Welcome out. <laughs> yeah. 
um, it's just such a different, it's unrecognizable the way the church is now to what it was then. There's, there's no comparison. Um, communication, was, as I told you before, was wide open. Uh, Ron used to tell us his stories when we were there, when I was there on the ship for the clearing course in 1967 um, or 68. I think it was the end of 67, 68, we all went to Valencia. And he was there, CSing us on the upper levels. And I did the clearing course. It was the first AO, Advanced Organization, which was on the ship, which turned into the Apollo. Originally, it was the Royal Scotman. And he used to stand up on the bridge at night and tell us his spooky stories about when he was uh, playing all these games in the whole track and he was flying his spaceships around and playing with these race cars and he'd keep coming back in a new lifetime and he'd find out and he'd still be playing the same game of being uh, kind of a racing specialist and he would keep breaking his own record because one lifetime he was the blue streak and another lifetime he was the green um, energy bolt or something, I don't remember all the names, but he had all these different names um, the Red Devil, and t names like that. And he would tell us he didn't know that he was breaking his own record. So he liked to go on and on about that. That was really fun. And this was around 2 in the morning. And while he was there, and I was there, and there were a few of us still able to keep our eyes open, and he, I said, I, I want to ask you a question about the clearing course. And he said, go ahead. And I asked him a question. So it was a confident, now it would be confidential. Well, I think it was then too, because it was the clearing course. And I asked him and he said, okay. And instead of answering the question, he ran me on a process right in the middle of the night on the deck of the ship. <laughs> and it was a, um, a repetitive alternate question. Uh, tell me something you know about this deck. Thank you. Tell me something you don't know about this deck. Thank you. And he just kept running that on and on and on, and I was giving him answers that I could think of, what I knew about the deck and, you know, what I perceived. And suddenly I said, you know, there's very little that I can really tell you about this deck. I don't know very much about this deck at all, where it came from, who made it, what are the materials in it, um, how long it's been here, what it was before, what trees it came from, who knows? I, I have very little knowledge about it. And I was laughing, you know, I, if I knew everything about this deck, I mean, I would be amazing. I mean, I would be totally OT. And he said, thank you. He said, to the degree that you don't know everything about this deck is to the degree that you have charge on it. Well, this was uh, quite revealing because it made me go on a sort of a head trip with all night I was going on with this idea that to the degree I don't know everything about the ship, this planet, this universe, <laughs> existence, just to the degree I have charge on. I went exterior to everything that I didn't know everything about. It was a really amazing experience that he set me off on this wild journey and I realized that not know, which is one step down from no on the no to mystery scale, um, is where the charge begins, you know? That's where you start getting aberrated. Like he says, all games are aberrated, some are fun, and it's kind of a trade-off. So it was a big cognition for me, and I was very happy to have had that experience, although I was up all night, but that was okay. It was really fun. So that was another sort of para experience for me, anyway, in those early days. And I found that as I became more and more trained, because training, as he said, is more than 50% of case gain. So I did the briefing course, I did the class seven internship, I did the OT levels at AO UK, which was um, the landed off the ship, the first AO, well, the first AO off the ship, I guess, was St. Hill, and then it moved up to Edinburgh, Scotland. And I was at St. Hill. I had done the briefing course, and I had done the Class 7 internship. And I had to escape from St. Hill because the uh, 
the OEC or the head, the ED of the uh, of St. Hill at that time was Herbie Parkhouse. Some of you might have heard of him. Herbie Parkhouse, famous, yeah, GO person in the old days. Anyway, he was there before. I mean, Ron had him running the canteen at one point. He was taken off of all technical posts forever by L. Ron Hubbard because of his uh, style of training, which you could say was pretty invalidative. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so he was um, just riveted on this idea that he had to save St. Hill. He was always in emergency or danger or something. So he stole me and my then husband, Artie Marin, and, uh, <laughs> oh, I forgot to ask how many were here for, who are in the church now. Is anybody here that's in the church now on lines? Or can't you say? <laughs> well, if you are here from the church, welcome. Okay, so he, um, he was being, he was stolen. We were still, we were New York staff on contract and we were getting all this training and then Herbie stole us and put us on posts illegally at St. Hill. So I had to escape from that and I finished the internship and managed to get up to Edinburgh by an escort who took us, took me to the uh, OT liaison and got me up to Edinburgh uh, kind of like bypassing all the usual stuff you had to go through. And um, I got up there, and as I went up the OT levels, I got more and more OT. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> I didn't get, in other words, this might be unusual for you to get this idea, but who have left the church recently, no stops, no barriers, no delays, no endless regging, um, just, uh, yeah, no sec checking at all, none, no eligibility, just, you're here to get your upper levels. That's wonderful. Just sail along and do it. And it was very friendly. And I have to say, Captain Bill Robertson had just established AO UK. And then he had left with his wife, Joan, who was a friend of mine from New York. And I knew Bill as well. And he was a very friendly guy. And he was LRH's most trusted member of the Sea Org. He was his right-hand man. He was 100%. And everything Captain Bill has done in Ron's org, which he established after Ron's departure, um, he has given 100% credit to L. Ron Hubbard for everything that he put together uh, beyond knots or from Excalibur on. And uh, it's all LRH. So those people who think that Ron's org or Captain Bill or whatever is squirrely weird stuff it's just basics is what and comes down to just the basic application of the subject and he just kind of put the boots on in the sky after Ron wasn't around anymore which Ron asked for someone to do if you remember his uh, request for that somebody's gonna have to put the boots on so he did I would say he's done that more than anybody but anyway he was running AO UK and it was a very friendly place and easy to go. And anywhere Captain Bill was, including AOLA, Advanced Organization Los Angeles, he had established that and it was friendly and easy to get services. So wherever he was, he, you know, the intention runs down the org board of the senior exec running it, and this is true of any group, and he definitely established ARC wherever he was. As uh, unusual of a person he was and how uh, he acted, I mean, he was always in calm, friendly and everything. Some people didn't agree with him. Well, we can't please everyone, but he was a good man because of his application of the basics. So anyway, um, I went up there and as I went up the OT levels and got more and more OT, which was in those days allowed and didn't take that long, several months, um, I was able to make my postulates work and they worked more and more to the point where I would reach out for a pencil and it would roll toward me. <laughs> I wanted to um, get my next level and it just appeared, the money appeared in my account. Someone secretly put money and didn't even tell me who it was, like a contribution. Artie was being kept in the broom closet down in um, St. Hill because Herbie was there. 
uh, he was blaming Artie for the drop in the statistics. The stats crashed on the Class 7 internship because all the Americans were kicked out of the country because of what they did in, the, uh, in Parliament, in the British Parliament. They decided to kick out the Scientologists, not renew their visa, whatever. So he was in trouble down there, <laughs> being blamed because he was illegally put on the post of intern class seven internship supervisor. So we, I, I was uh, at AO UK and I said to uh, the captain, I said, you know, oh, they called me up. Oh, I know what happened. I was in Qual helping out because I finished my levels. And I said to Qual, you know, I need my next level of training. Um, class seven, I'm OT6, which was old OT or original, I won't say old, original OT6, which was an OT level for sure. I mean, you were exterior. I mean, it was an amazing level. And your postulates just had to work. Every, that's, why, that's why I was going OT is because I was doing these OT drills, which was OT6. So um, I said, I need my next level of training. And the Qualsec said, well, I'm sorry, but there's no class eight course. It hasn't come out yet. I said, when is it coming out? He said, I don't know. Well, that night I got the call from the New York Org to go to the ship for the Class 8 course. It was just power. I was in power on the levels because that's the way they work when they're allowed to. So I got, um, I got Qual to give me their, but while, before I left, obviously, I was still there, and poor Artie was in the broom closet with chains on or something, <laughs> some bizarre application of the ethics policies. And because uh, <laughs> the stats had crashed, and uh, so I said, so I said, okay, give me all your backlog. And they had a backlog of people all the way down the staircase, down to the lobby of AOUK on uh, Fleet Street in Edinburgh, Scotland. And there was like this huge um, line of people who needed review. So I said, I'll do the reviews. Just give them to me. So they set me up in a room with a meter and. I could take them in, give them an interview. They filled out a routing form, what their problem was, what they wanted handled, what they weren't doing well, and I um, would handle it. I mean, I'd find out what it was. It was either a misunderstood, a misapplication, an overrun, an invalidation. You know, there was always something typical. And I just found what it would be and cleared up the bypass charge or the, the area that had been unhandled. And they went back happily into session, and they were mostly solo auditors. That's why they were coming. So it finally, the staircase was empty. There was no more backlog in Qual. So the captain was so happy, which was the new captain, not Captain Bill. He turned it over to Wally Burgess. He said to me, anything you want. You can have anything you want for doing this. You cleaned up our backlog. We'll give you whatever you want. I said, OK, I want Artie. Get him out of the broom closet. <laughs> So he said, done. So he got together with his associates and they worked out a plan where they sent a summons down to St. Hill ordering Artie Marin to come up and get handled as a, um, a, a, some sort of problem, OT or something, whatever word they used, to get him up to, and be repaired at AOUK. And uh, there was nothing anybody could say about it because the senior orgs had it over the lower orgs and the hierarchy was in place and he had to go. So he came up to Edinburgh and he went on his OT levels and then it all transpired the way I described it where I said I need my next level of training and then he and I got the call to go to the ship to be trained on the first class eight course ever given by L. Ron Hubbard on the ship in Corfu, Greece. So that was the uh, spookiest thing. <laughs> Thank you. That was the spookiest thing that ever happened to me so far of making a postulate. And I had, when I first came into Scientology, I said, I am going to meet Ron. And I am going to be trained by him. And I am going to be in on some research. And I am going to be his guinea pig. That's what I said to my friends at the New York Org when I first came in because it's what I wanted to have happen. It was a postulate. I didn't even know what a postulate was. And sure enough, I got called to the ship. There we were, 35 of us from the outer orgs, all sent to get trained. And then they had the Sea Org 
in another hold in another part of the ship. The original uh, purpose of the ship itself was a cattle ferry. So we were the org cattle, and then they had the sea org cattle. And uh, we did this course, and we got onto the part where you have to do, if anyone is familiar with the whole track dating drill. Well, that's where you have to find a date on the other person using a meter that the coach mocks up a date, whole track, could be anything, you know, uh, 52 trillion, 49 billion, and writes out this long, long, long date down to the hours and the minutes, and you have to find it on the meter, even though it isn't charged, particularly. I'm sure you remember this at St. Hill, right? Malcolm, his class. <laughs> yeah. So we did that, and we had to, on the briefing course, but we had to do it again on the Class 8 course. Well, the Class 8 course was only three weeks long. So how were we going to do the whole track dating drill in three days or two days? And he said, you're going to get this done today. And we said, good luck. So he says, all right, well, uh, first we're going to do it off the meter. And we're going to do whole track dating by finding orders of magnitude, you know, more than a million, less than a million, things like that. And you see the skin color change, and you see the eyes and the pupils, and you watch the indicators completely. Now, when you learn to really uh, operate the e-meter, you find out that it responds exactly according to the TRs and comm cycle of the auditor. <laughs> well, when you're doing a whole track day off the meter where you have to watch skin variations, color, and energy changes, your TRs are pretty well in. And your comm cycle is right on. And you get these indications, and you get these dates, and it was magic, because we got the whole track dates off the meter. And then Craig DeFan, our supervisor, said, OK, now put it on the meter. And the meter just jumped up and down and played Dixie, and the lights went off, and the bells whistled, and it was a, a piece of cake. So that was another example of postulates, abilities, OT, awareness, perception, all those things that make the uh, adventure so worthwhile of going up the bridge. And that's what we all experienced. Um, I've had a lot of adventures with L. Ron Hubbard and what he put there for us all. I'm very grateful for it. So um, there it is. Thank you.